finest judges serve on D.C. courts, but the Congress has to approve each one of them. And when the federal budget shuts down because of a budget impasse, it creates turmoil, budget turmoil, for the District of Columbia. And when the Congress fails to vote to confirm highly qualified judges for weeks, for months, and sometimes for years, justice is delayed and sometimes justice is denied. 245 years ago, 13 colonies took on the mightiest nation on earth, England, because of unjust treatment. They found particularly galling the requirement to pay taxes without representation. Taxation without representation became the rallying cry that led to our Declaration of Independence and a war to achieve it. The people of the District of Columbia have no interest in waging a war for independence. They just want to be treated fairly and justly. We should do that. And we can start doing that by enacting legislation that has passed the House of Representatives and is the subject of today's hearing. That is the right thing to do. The right thing to do. It meets constitutional muster. It puts the District of Columbia on the very same path followed by all 37 states who have entered the Union since, I believe, 1791. To paraphrase Mark Twain, when in doubt, do what's right. You'll amaze your friends and confound your foes. Let's do what's right. We start by treating our neighbors here in the District of Columbia the way we want to be treated. And oh, by the way, I want to give you another quote that may come as a surprise. It did to me and it might to you as well. Here's another quote. The fact that more than half a million Americans live in the District of Columbia and are denied a single voting representative in Congress is clearly an historic wrong and justice demands that it be addressed. I don't agree with uh, our former Vice President Mike Pence on everything, but we certainly agree on this one. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Carper, and thank you uh, for your leadership on this issue over, over, over many years. Bef before I introduce uh, our witnesses, uh, I want to give two uh, very important uh, guests an opportunity to provide uh, remarks. Our, our first uh, is uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, the delegate to the United States House of Representatives from the District uh, of Columbia. Congresswoman Holmes Norton has, without question, been the leading voice in this fight uh, for statehood, as she has worked uh, tirelessly, I think that is a good word to sum up your work, Congresswoman, tirelessly to provide her constituents with uh, equal representation throughout her 15-year, uh, or 15 term, excuse me, 15-term tenure in the Congress. She uh, recently led the passage of the Washington, D.C. Admission Act through the Congress uh, earlier this year. Welcome, Congresswoman. Again, thank you for your tireless uh, leadership on this issue, and I speak for the entire committee. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you very much. Microphone. Is it on now? I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman P Peters, on behalf of the 700,000 District of Columbia residents, including 30,000 veterans. I thank you for holding and for being an original co-sponsor, uh, uh, for holding this hearing and for being an original co-sponsor of the District of Columbia statehood bill. This hearing is of historic significance because it is only the second Senate hearing on our DC statehood bill in the nation's history. In the last year, the House of Representatives has twice passed the state, the, our DC statehood bill. In 1993, when I first came to the House of Representatives, I got the first ever House vote on D.C. statehood, but the bill failed because the House had a very different composition then. Prior to last year, neither chamber of Congress had ever passed the D.C. statehood bill in the nation's history. Senator Carper, I particularly thank you for, for sponsoring 
our DC statehood bill and for being a champion for DC in the Senate where we have no representation. Following in the footsteps of Senator Joel Lieberman, under your leadership, the DC statehood bill has 45 Senate co-sponsors, which is the greatest number of Senate co-sponsors of the bill in the nation's history. President Biden strongly supports DC statehood, our DC statehood bill, and is the first president to put the full weight of the presidency behind the bill in the nation's history. 54%, that's a growing number, 54% of the American people, more than half of the American people, support DC statehood. According to a recent very detailed poll, this is the greatest support for DC statehood in the nation's history. Congress has both the moral obligation and the constitutional authority to pass our DC statehood bill. The country was founded on the principles of no taxation without representation and consent of the government, but DC residents are taxed without representation and cannot consent to the laws under which they as American citizens must live. The state of Washington, D.C. would consist of 66 of the 68 square miles of the present day federal district. The federal district would be two square miles and Congress would retain control over it as required by the Constitution. The D.C. statehood bill clearly complies with the Constitution, including the Admissions Clause, the District Clause, and the 23rd Amendment. Those who believe the bill is, is constitutional need only rely on the plain text of the Constitution. A group of very distinguished law professors and scholars from America's top law schools have sent a definitive analysis of the bill's constitutional constitutionality to the House and Senate leadership. You already have that, so I don't believe I need to ask that it be admitted to the record. The admissions clause gives Congress the authority to admit new sta states. All 37 new states were admitted by Congress by majority vote. No state was admitted by constitutional amendment and no state would have to consent to the admission of the state of Washington, D.C. The district clause gives Congress plenary authority over the federal district and establishes a maximum size of the federal district, 100 square miles. It does not establish a minimum size or a location of the federal district. Congress reduced the size of the federal district by 30% in 1846. The 23rd Amendment allows the federal district to participate in the Electoral College, but does not establish a minimum size or location of the federal district. Therefore, the bill complies with the 23rd Amendment. Nevertheless, the bill would repeal the Enabling Act for the 23rd Amendment, and the 23rd Amendment itself would be repealed quickly. The Constitution does not establish any prerequisites for new states, but Congress generally has considered three, population and resources, support for statehood, and commitment to democracy. The state of Washington D.C. would meet all three. D.C. D.C.'s population is larger than the population of two states. D.C. pays more federal taxes per capita, and I will repeat that one. The residents I represent 
pay more taxes per capita than any state and pay more federal taxes right now than 21 states. DC's federal domestic product is larger than 17 states. In 2016, 86% of DC residents voted for statehood. DC residents have been petitioning for voting representation in the Congress and local autonomy for, for all of its 220 years of existence from the moment this became the capital of the United States. Congress does have a choice. It can continue to exclude DC residents from the democratic process, forcing them to watch from the sidelines as Congress votes on federal and DC laws and to treat them in the words of Frederick Douglass as aliens, not citizens but subjects, or it can live up to our nation's founding principles and pass our DC statehood bill. Again, Chairman Peters and Senator Carper, thank you for your leadership on this bill. I look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues to enact this DC statehood bill, this Congress. Thank you again. Congresswoman uh, Holmes Arden, thank you uh, for your statement. And again, thank you uh, for your leadership uh, on this issue. Our second guest is uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, who represented Connecticut in the Senate for 24 years. Senator Lieberman served as both the chairman and the ranking member of this uh, very committee. In 2012, he helped author the New Columbia Admissions Act, the first DC statehood bill to be introduced in the Senate in nearly 20 years. Senator Lieberman, yeah, you may proceed with your statement. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and uh, members of the committee for uh, convening this hearing today and uh, for giving me the honor of uh, testifying. Delegate Norton, Mayor Bowser, and other distinguished witnesses, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, as Senator Carper alluded to, uh, just a few years ago, uh, Delegate Norton and I were at law school together. And uh, uh, we haven't aged at all uh, since then. I, w I, I will point out um, that the mascot of, uh, we, have, we were lucky to go to Yale, the mascot at Yale is a bulldog. And I don't think anyone would argue with me if I said that Delegate Norton on this particular issue, and many others, has had the tenacity of a bulldog, uh, occasionally the bark, and if necessary, the bite. Uh, so. It's always good to be on her side. Uh, a special thank you, talking about tenacity, uh, to Senator Carper, my dear friend, for introducing and advocating uh, this legislation, which really would right a wrong that has been done for too long uh, to the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, I'm honored, really personally, to have the opportunity to return uh, to this committee in this room where I spent uh, so many of the best, most productive uh, days of my 24 years in the U.S. Senate, um, in large part because uh, uh, I was privileged to work in bipartisan partnership with the leading Republicans on the committee during that time. First, uh, Fred Thompson of Tennessee and then uh, for more than a decade, Susan Collins of Maine. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, spirit of bipartisanship, uh, which has been part of this committee's history and really has been exemplified, I think already this year by uh, Chairman Peters and Ranking Member uh, Portman, will guide your committee's consideration of the deprivation of voting representation in Congress for citizens of our capital city. As you know, as um, far as anyone can tell, the only citizens of any capital, of any country in the world, who are disenfranchised in this way. I first introduced legislation uh, on this subject 
uh, in 2002, uh, when some of the current committee staff members were probably in elementary school. Um, it was called the No Taxation Without Representation Act and was, uh, I'm pleased to say, reported favorably from the committee but was not acted on by the Senate. In 2009, uh, a group of us introduced the D.C. House Voting Rights Act, which was favorably reported by this committee and in fact passed by the Senate in a vote of 61 to 37. Unfortunately, however, the Senate added an amendment that repealed uh, D.C.'s gun control laws and therefore the House never acted on the legislation. Uh, in 2012, which was my last year in the Senate, a group of us introduced the D.C. statehood legislation, which is very much like Senator Carper's initiative that is before you today. But uh, Senator Carper's done a much better th job than I did. <laughs> He's got the largest ever number of co-sponsors uh, for this legislation. It's really a tribute uh, to the cause and to his tenacity and advocacy. When Senator Carper asked me uh, if I would get involved in supporting the current proposal, I immediately said yes. The truth is I was very grateful to Tom for giving me the opportunity to re-engage in this constitutional cause that's mattered to me for a long time. And it's mattered to me because there are two great American constitutional principles that, at the, that are at the heart of the cause of D.C. statehood and that are violated every day uh, in the current tre treatment of residents of the District of Columbia. Both of these principles were central to the American Revolution against the British Crown. The first is that governments should govern only with the consent of the governed not by the whim of the crown or any other leader, particularly not a dictator. And that in a great democracy, a republic like ours, that consent is given by the votes of the citizenry. The second, uh, as has been mentioned, a great founding principle is that citizens uh, should not and cannot uh, be taxed without representation in the legislative body that taxes them. And here in general, I quote Justice uh, Hugo Black, who wrote in Westbury versus Sanders, a 1964 uh, Supreme Court decision, no right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which we must live, end quote. Uh, today's residents of the District of Columbia, as has been said, have every right to sound the battle cry of our revolution, no taxation without representation. Uh, greater per capita income tax paid from residents of the district and more in total than uh, the residents and citizens of 21 other existing states. So why would anyone not want to eliminate these grossly outdated un-American inequities? Uh, today, you will hear some arguments why from the witnesses who will testify against Senator Carper's legislation. I must say respectfully that I've, I've heard the arguments before many times over the years, and uh, uh, I suppose as judges say, I've reached a decision <laughs> All the arguments seem to me to be legalistic uh, disputations and ultimately excuses for something that is inexcusable. The arguments against this legislation don't come near to overcoming the great principled constitutional arguments for it. So what's the problem? Well, the media suggests it is not constitutional or philosophical, but political and partisan. That Republicans today fear that granting equal voting representation in Congress to D.C. residents will inevitably lead to two more Democratic senators and one more Democratic member of the House. I hope that is not the problem, because it is self-evidently unacceptable 
in America con to condition the enjoyment of constitutional rights on political party membership any more than Congress would condition access to constitutional rights on citizens' race or gender or religion or sexual orientation. Besides, uh, it's just not sensible to base one's vote on this legislation, which would correct an injustice forever on a short-range political prediction, which, based on history, may well turn out to be baseless or at least temporary. Who among us can really predict how the citizens of the state of Washington, D.C. will vote in elections for the representatives in Congress in 50 years or 20 years or even five years? For example, who would have predicted five years ago that the state of Georgia would elect two Democratic senators uh, to this Congress? Who could have predicted 30, 40, 50 years ago that there would be almost no Republicans from New England, my part of the country, in the Senate today, and almost no Democrats from the House, which is obviously why we were so surprised by the election of the two Democrats from Georgia. A look at American history shows that partisan anxieties have been common when states have been considered for admission to our union since the original 13. But 37 times these anxieties were overcome to enable us to become the United States of America we are today. Here's an example which I think proves the, um, the difficulty of deciding this issue ba based on uh, political predictions. In 1959, uh, Alaska and Hawaii were both seeking admission to our union. Uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, how the citizens of those states would vote. Uh, they were essentially both admitted together, though there was a separation of a few months, because they were expected to balance each other politically. Alaska was expected to vote Democratic, and Hawaii was expected to vote Republican. That was the bipartisan consensus prophecy in 1959. I can tell you in my 24 years in the Senate, and still today, the opposite <clears throat> is the case. Hawaii elects Democrats and uh, Alaska has elected Republicans. So much for deciding great constitutional issues, such as this one, because of passing political uh, prognostications. It's not only a weak basis for judgment, uh, it's unacceptable in our system of law and equity. Mr. Chairman, many times in my 24 years on this committee, our members were able to find bipartisan solutions to difficult problems, and then to convince the Senate uh, to agree with those solutions, and together we got some great and good things done for our country, I'm proud to say. Uh, I hope you members of the committee in this session will similarly rise to the challenge of this moment and this problem and work together to get something good and great done for our country, our constitution, and for the people of our capital city. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Lieberman and uh, Congresswoman Holmes Norton uh, for uh, your perspective uh, on this issue. I'd now like to invite our witnesses uh, up to their chairs and to get settled. And uh, as uh, we are making uh, those uh, changes, as the witnesses are coming to their seats, uh, I'd also uh, like to welcome uh, our esteemed guest uh, to stay for the remainder if, uh, of the hearing if their schedules uh, allow. Uh, as we set up to move into the next phase of this uh, hearing, I hope my, my colleagues will pause and reflect on the remarks of Representative Norton and, and Senator Lieberman uh, with their depth of knowledge uh, and experience working to provide D.C. residents uh, with an equal voice in our 
democratic process. I think they have set the tone uh, for today's uh, very historic uh, hearing. Today's hearing is not about uh, political posturing, uh, and it shouldn't be predicated on predetermined uh, views. It is simply about providing D.C. residents full and equal democratic uh, rights. President Eisenhower, I think, said it best in his 1954 State of the Union address, and I quote President Dwight Eisenhower when he said, quote, in the District of Columbia, the time is long overdue for granting national suffrage to its citizens and also applying the principle of local self-government to the nation's capital. 60, that was uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and now 67 years later, those words still ring true. Like folks throughout our nation, uh, my constituents, and I know the constituents of everyone in this committee, uh, deserve a complete voice uh, in government. It's long past time for the Senate to pass this act. Uh, and uh, now that the witnesses have been uh, settled, uh, I would like uh, each of the witnesses to know that the, it's the practice of this committee, Homeland Security and Government Affairs, to swear in witnesses. So if you will uh, rise and raise your right hand, we have witnesses uh, also on video, if you would do the same, I'd appreciate it. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You may be seated. Our first witness is Mayor Muriel Bowser, the eighth mayor of the District of Columbia. In her role, Mayor Bowser serves as the District of Columbia's chief executive and functions as its governor, county executive, uh, and mayor. You have a lot on your plate, uh, Mayor, and it's certainly wonderful to see you here before the committee today, and you may proceed uh, with your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and members of this esteemed committee, thank you for convening this hearing on S-51, the Washington, D.C. Admission Act, which provides the 700,000 residents of Washington, D.C. full democracy. I am Muriel Bowser, Mayor of Washington, D.C., and I'm honored to come before this committee with a simple request. Senators, we ask you to right the wrong that occurred some 220 years ago when the residents of the District of Columbia were stripped of their full congressional representation, and we ask you to do it now. The Constitution left the issue of democracy for residents of the District of Columbia to the Congress. The House of Representatives has passed the Washington, D.C. Admission Act twice, and the White House has indicated its support for the, for the bill through a statement of administration policy. Our democracy is truly in the hands of this Senate. It is the time for the U.S. Senate to support the D.C. petition for statehood. My testimony today echoes the many arguments that I made before the House Committee on Oversight and Reform in March uh, and in September of 2019. And some of the same arguments made by my predecessor in this very room in 2014. Then as now, the district's call for full democracy has been drowned out by arguments that ignore the fact um, that the second class status of DC residents is clearly an anomaly of the United States Constitution, not a feature of it. Over the decades, arguments against DC statehood have ranged from uh, assertions that are quite frankly preposterous to inaccurate legal claims. Just to cite a couple, in 2019, we were asked what would happen to the parking spaces for congressional staff if the district were to become a state. We were at a loss uh, to see how our full democracy uh, should be equated to just a few parking spaces. This March, I was confronted with concerns that the district could not be a state uh, because it was believed that we didn't have a car dealership, even though we do. Statements like these uh, not only discount the civil rights of DC residents, they also demonstrate a true lack of understanding of the rapidly growing and thriving businesses, neighborhoods, and culture that surround the small federal presence. 
It is for uh, those neighborhoods and those people, the neighborhoods of Michigan Park, uh, where I was born and raised, Congress Park in Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights, and Hillcrest among them, that make up 99% of the district. And the people who live in them, uh, who have come to DC for school, government service, or other work, I appear today to represent them. There is no legal or constitutional barrier to DC statehood. The prevailing constitutional issue is the civil rights violation of 700,000 DC residents who fulfill all obligations of United States citizenship, but are denied any representation in this body. We say, uh, and we rely on the opinions of 39 legal scholars who have submitted testimony to you unequivocally that the bill before you, S-51, the Washington DC Admission Act is constitutional. Dozens of America's most recognized constitutional experts have testified before Congress and penned letters to that effect. Scholars and experts have opined that it is fully within Congress's power under the Constitution to make D.C. a state through the passage of F-51. The Constitution's admissions clause grants Congress authority to admit states into the Union, including Washington, D.C. Following the 13 colonies, all 37 states were admitted by Congress through this constitutional authority. States were added so Solely be, were not added solely because of a particular industry or the size of its land mass. Uh, states were added uh, to include the people. The Constitution's district clause poses no barrier to admitting D.C. as a state either. The district clause sets a maximum size of 10 square miles for the federal district, not a minimum size. S1, S51, of course, retains a federal district as required by the Constitution. It encompasses the unpopulated areas that make up the federal presence, including all of the House and Senate office buildings, the Capitol itself, of course, the Supreme Court building, the White House, the monuments and museums on the National Mall, and all of their federal buildings and land. The people of America, when they come to the nation's capital, they will still find all of the great monuments and museums that make up their experience, and of course, the free museums of the Smithsonian Institution. The 23rd Amendment to the Constitution, which granted DC residents a vote for president in 1961, does not pose a constitutional barrier to statehood either. The bill addresses it head on by repealing statutory language that enables the appointment of electors and it includes expedited procedures for consideration of the repeal of the unnecessary constitutional amendment, thus virtually ensuring quick and certain ratification by the states to ensure no ambiguity about the electoral votes. S-51 outlines a clear path forward on how to address the 23rd admission post-DC's admission. It is particularly contradictory that the 23rd Amendment, which was passed to expand democracy to taxpaying DC residents, is now being held up as the main barrier to further expanding constitutional rights in the district. This flies in the face of the amendment's intent. Retrocession to Maryland is also not required, uh, nor is it addressed in the Constitution. Maryland has no claim to the land it ceded to the federal government when the district was founded. Uh, certainly, no one in this body would suggest that Maine should retrocede to Massachusetts or that West Virginia should return to Virginia. Of course not. To be clear, D.C.'s current status is due to generations of an inactivity by lawmakers, including um, the founding fathers themselves, failing to address the contradiction that D.C. residents of the U.S. Capitol are treated as second-class citizens. With no constitutional underpinning, the disenfranchisement of Washingtonians is a uh, a glaring civil rights and voting rights issue uh, of our time. 
In fact, we are the only capital, as has been stated, uh, in uh, the world's democracies without voting rights in the national legislature. In two weeks, the country will celebrate our Independence Day and the establishment of the United States as a sovereign nation, free from taxation without representation. Yet the 700,000 predominantly black and brown residents of Washington, D.C., have continued to pay taxes without representation for over 200 years. As we celebrate our nationhood, I appeal to this Senate to end the ongoing systemic injustice faced by a growing population in DC uh, and vote for statehood in the 117th Congress. We cannot emphasize enough the civil rights and full democracy of DC residents is in your hands. We are 700,000 people, some born here, others from all 50 states and many nations in the world. We are Washingtonians who serve proudly in our military and fight for our country, and we are 30,000 veterans of our armed forces. We are Washingtonians. We have served on the front line as essential workers during this pandemic doctors, nurses, firefighters, school teachers, and yet we have no say in this Senate. We are Washingtonians who heroically defended our nation's capital during the January 6th insurrection by answering to the call to support our federal partners, despite not having any representation in the Senate. We are Washingtonians. Uh, we don't have any say uh, when this Senate considers presidential nominations, Supreme Court justices, and large investments like the CARES Act or the American Jobs Plan. I ask you today to treat DC residents the same as all tax-paying Americans. Your inaction could doom yet another generation of Washingtonians to being locked out of their constitutional power and human rights. Will this body perpetuate this civil rights and voting rights wrong? By what authority would this body continue to have Washingtonians pay federal income taxes without a voice? Today, I'm asking that the United States Senate usher in a new age of fairness and equality for D.C. residents. One thing I know about D.C. residents uh, is that they have been fighting uh, for this for 220 years. We will not quit until we achieve full de democracy. And our two senators are seated here with you. D.C. residents are not standing alone. Over the years, we have garnered the support of Americans of all stripes and beliefs, the bipartisan United States Conference of Mayors, for example, representing millions of Americans in big cities and small towns, the nonpartisan League of Women Voters, who for 100 years have fought to defend our democracy, the NAACP, the Human Rights Campaign, and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, who recognize DC statehood for the civil and human rights contradiction um, that it is. To your former colleague and independent Senator Joe Lieberman, whose focus on justice and fairness makes plain why partisan considerations have absolutely nothing to do with the quest of DC citizens for full democracy and absolutely no place in, in ensuring the S-51 moves forward in the 117th Congress. Uh, finally, uh, Chairman, together uh, with leaders across America, we know that we will keep pushing until DC's tragic disenfranchisement is rectified. You have the power uh, to make two things happen that I see so clearly in my mind's eye and feel so deeply in my heart and soul. With your courageous leadership and clear-eyed focus on fairness and perfecting our union today, this session, this Congress, you will vote to admit DC into our great American union. And secondly, and prayerfully, I will be the last DC mayor who needs to sit here demanding on behalf of our 700,000 residents, what is our birthright and what is owed to us as taxpayers, and that's full citizenship and democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senators, and we're happy um, to take your questions. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor, for your, for your opening statement. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.